Hi, this is Brian Forrester, and today we're back in Egypt, not exploring the Great Pyramid, but actually Saqqara, which is a very big site. This is the famous steppe period of Djoser, or Zoser, and this is likely the first time that the dynastic Egyptians tried to build a large pyramid. But what do you make of this shaft cut into the solid bedrock? It's one of many in this location at Saqqara, and it's likely a pre-dynastic construction made by the master builders because we also find these on the area of Giza, as in where the Great Pyramids are located. So I'm not interested in the dynastic period, uh, though it's a splendid history of ancient Egypt. What I'm looking for are examples of lost ancient high technology and catastrophic damage. So what we're seeing here are very hard stone surfaces that appear not a, to have been necessarily vandalized, but more likely were victims of a massive cataclysm of some kind. Now some of these surfaces you can see, the weathering is very strange. It's like they were, the stones were hit with a very high heat. Not simple vandalism, though of course the structures would have been utilized as quarries during the dynastic times and also well into the Roman times. But what has happened to this little pyramid? It's not simply people taking hammers and trying to break it up. It looks like it has been struck by high heat. And we'll see many other examples of this that tend to support Dr. Robert Schock's theory that plasma was ejected from the sun and struck certain parts of the earth about 12,000 years ago. So when you look at the top layer of the soil, see it's orangey, brownish looking. That's what happens to limestone when it's hit with very high heat. And here is another example. The top surface is there. And again, how was this little pyramid, which was immaculately constructed, how was it damaged so heavily like this? Again, my theory, and when we look at these burn marks that you see on the surface of the limestone, was that this pyramid and others were hit by solar plasma 12,000 years ago. And then later, they were found by the dynastic Egyptians somewhere around 5,000 years ago. So let's go inside the pyramid here, the Pyramid of Unas. Un Unas was a pharaoh. He was quite possibly buried in this pyramid, but he and his people did not construct it. The walls in this case appear to be granite on the left and right sides, and the lid, or ceiling, and that granite would have been brought from at least 500 miles away from the quarries at Aswan. And here again, the walls appear to be granite. If this was used for strength, that is a possibility. However, it may have been used for energetic purposes, which is something I get into in other videos that I've done about Egypt. And now we're going to go into the back recess underground here at the Unas Pyramid and have a look at this really intriguing box that some people would say is a sarcophagus, but the stone is very fine, tight-grained granite. And again, the box would have had to have been transported from Aswan, which is more than 500 miles away. And it appears that the lid was supposed to hermetically seal the box. Now, for most of their time, the dynastic people only had Bronze Age level technology so there's no way that they were able to shape this box um, with such finesse. So this uh, Unas Pyramid has been recently opened up for us to explore. We were there in March of 2018. And now we're going to climb back outside of it and explore more of the Saqqara area. So once again, the Djoser Pyramid or Zoser Pyramid 
And this could be a construction done by the dynastic people because you see it's relatively small stones that are stacked on top of each other. But I wonder where those staircases go. They appear to go underground somewhere. Maybe they connect with the ancient tunnel system, which is spoken of not only here, but also throughout the Giza Plateau area, which is immense. It's not just the area where you find the Great Pyramids, but it includes places like Saqqara, Abu Sir, Abu Rawash, etc. And now we look down, you see the top level is dynastic, but below that, cut into the bedrock. So again, the bedrock cutting is probably a pre-dynastic work. And here we have another look at that. You see, stacked stone on top of cutting into the bedrock itself. Now, here we are at one of my favorite places at Saqqara, and this is called the Serapium. Again, notice that the upper layer appears to be burnt or scorched by heat. And as we walk into the Serapium, uh, this is one of the most spectacular places by far in all of ancient Egypt because of the mysterious boxes we're going to look at. Uh, the site was discovered by the archaeologist Mariette, I believe in the 19th century, and had been relatively unknown for a long period before that. It is literally underground. The dynastic people probably found it, but the constructions you're going to see could not have been done by the dynastic people. The first thing is, if the lights weren't on, this place would be pitch black. And so, so how could they possibly have quarried out this huge tunnel system that goes through it? There's no appearance of any soot or anything like that on the ceiling. And so the construction of this tunnel system, which appears to have been repaired, as you can see on the left, in different periods of time, Lighting must have been artificial in some way, and though that sounds hard to believe, you will believe it when you see what these boxes look like. It appears in some ways that the Serapium is a climate-controlled atmosphere, because every time I've been there, and it's been at least six times so far, it's always about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or approximately 20 degrees Celsius, which is a very pleasant temperature. It's not like something uh, like the interior of the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid, which is very, very warm. So the coolness, of course, is because it's subterranean. But the question is, what are these immense objects that we're about to see? How were they created? What were they possibly used for? And why, when Mariette discovered them, were all of the lids, except one, pried open. Very mysterious place. So the lid of this box weighs 30 tons, and the box itself weighs 70 tons. So that's 100 tons, and you can see the highly polished surfaces with the really crappy hieroglyphics done. Conventional academics insist that the shaping of the box and the hieroglyphics are contemporary with one another, but that is completely ridiculous. It's quite obvious that the dynastic people found these boxes in situ, and in some cases decided to carve hieroglyphics in some, uh, some of them. Again, the stone likely came either from the eastern desert or from um, <clears throat> Aswan. Also, these recesses you can see in the walls are larger than the length of the lid of the box. So that means that the indentations were likely made so that the tops, 30 tons a piece, could swivel open. And again, the surface is beautifully polished. The lid fits on so tightly that it would hermetically seal the box. There's no way a Bronze Age culture could have possibly done this work. Though the hieroglyphics, of course, they very much could have done. They are very crude, and because of the granular nature of the, um, of the granite with uh, the quartz content, uh, that's why the lines are not straight. And why are these indentation areas polished as well? 
It's very odd that the original builders didn't make them perfectly flat surfaces. If this was a resonant um, box of some kind for high technology or some other function, it could be that the indentations were for final tuning of the box because the acoustics inside are absolutely astonishing and the box um, loves the sound of the tone ohm. So again, the hieroglyphics are so crude, whoever the artisan was, he could not even, or she, could not even make a straight line because of the granular nature and the content of very hard quartz, uh, which is in the material itself. But the high polish of the surfaces is quite amazing. You would likely need to have something like diamond dust or powder to be able to produce a polished surface like that. And then as we turn, we're going to explore the fact that there are more than 20 of these massive boxes in situ in the Serapium at Saqqara. Now, not only are they in the niches, but they're, you can notice they're about five feet down into the niche. So the box would have to have been moved through the corridor, turned around a corner, and be gently placed downwards by about six feet or two meters into the niche itself. And again, intriguing that the interior walls are wider so that the top of the box could swivel freely. But how are you going to move a 30-ton lid by hand in such a narrow space? So we continue walking through the tunnel labyrinth system here at the Serapium and this little hallway connects up with the second long tunnel. Um, it does not have niches in it but it seems to be the way that the stone boxes were transported into the other tunnel system and what we're going to see here is very much telltale as to what was going on in ancient Egypt before the time of the dynastic people. What we're coming up to is one of the giant boxes without the lid and the surface is relatively rough so it was shaped likely before it was brought into the tunnel system of the Serapium and this is like it's locked in time. Something happened at the Serapium stopping all work. Once again there's no soot or anything like that um, on the ceilings and so candles or torches or whatever would not have been used um, in the fabrication of the tunnels or the movements of the boxes themselves. So artificial lighting of some kind would have to have been used and this, this goes along with the fact that these boxes had to have been made utilizing high levels of very advanced technology in some cases, technology beyond our capacity today. So as we walk past the unfinished box that likely would have been finished once it was very close to its niche, we see in the background the lid that was to accompany the box. So it's very likely and it's telling us that the box would have been moved first, then the lid second, the box would have probably then been put into its niche, then the lid, 30 tons, put on top of the box, but how was the polishing done to make such a beautiful seal? And then we have this other orphaned lid here, and we're going to go back into the main tunnel to see where its companion box might be located. So again, this is the main tunnel, and here you can see the flashlights uh, glinting off a smaller box, but very finely crafted, with some crude hieroglyphics put on later. This is the companion box for that monstrous lid that we saw just previously. You can see it wasn't finally finished, so the finishing would have to have been done in the niche itself. And Saqqara is a massive, massive site. 
And so there are other underground structures that we visited. Not as impressive as the Serapium, but still, if you're going to spend the entire day at Saqqara, then it's well worth to make efficient use of your time. So in the case of climbing into this little tunnel, which again appears to be lined with granite, then you literally have to get on your hands and knees and crawl. There's a lot of dust and ground up limestone on the floor, and so you'll definitely have to wash your clothes after this little adventure. But that's what visiting ancient Egypt, especially with us, is all about. It's seeing as much as possible and focusing on the most mysterious ancient constructions that could not have been achieved by the dynastic Egyptians, telling us that standard history is very short-sighted and that there are thousands of years of time in ancient Egypt that are not documented properly by standard academia. Now this box appears to be made of limestone, which could have been achieved, possibly, by the dynastic people with their bronze tools. But what are the strange scorch marks that we see on the stone, just like we saw on the surface with the little pyramid of Unis? So where will the next adventure be? Stay tuned! And upcoming tours and events at HiddenIncaTours.com We have an event in West Yorkshire in September that you can come and see me at. Also our Advanced Technologies and Wisdom of the Ancients Tour of India in January 2019. Mexico Ancient Technology Tour, February 2019. Yes, there are megalithic sites in Mexico. And of course, Egypt, Lost Ancient Technology and Metaphysics Tour in April 2019. And these are related books of mine at Amazon.com and on my website. The Enigma of Cranial Deformation co-written with David Hatcher Childress. Lost Ancient Technology of Egypt by myself. Aftershock, the Ancient Cataclysm that Erased Human History. This discusses the plasma and other ancient cataclysmic effects. Akhenaten, the Heretic Pharaoh, my personal favorite pharaoh, actually the only one I'm interested in, uh, and also, finally, Lost Ancient Technology of Egypt, Volume 2.